minutes. Sit erect, close the eyes. Think about Divine Supreme shining in our hearts. Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto all. Om Sthapakaya Ca Dharmasya Sarva Dharma Swarupine Sthapakaya Ca Dharmasya Sarva Dharma Swarupine Avatar Varishthaya Ramakrishna Yate Nama Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotirgamaya Mrityor ma mrityangamaya Om Shantish Shanti Shanti Let us offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from unreal to the real from darkness of ignorance to light of knowledge, from death to immortality. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is full of spiritual teachings. It is a ocean of knowledge Ocean of bliss. We must just take some ideas and practice it in our life. We enjoy the bliss. Sri Ramakrishna has clarified many things regarding the nature of God, Brahman, world. These are all being debated upon again and again. As long as the world exists, these debates do continue. The incarnations may come, they may explain, still the doubt lingers on. Because why the doubt lingers? Because each one will have to experience himself. It's only through experience one can be freed from the doubts. As long as there is worldliness in the mind, that means as long as the mind wants the world, that means as long as the mind wants to enjoy the world, the doubt remains. Whatever the explanations may be given, one cannot be freed from sorrow and suffering until and unless the mind is freed from these various uh, types of worldly entanglements. 
That is why it is mentioned in the peace chant. What is this world? It is all asat, unreal. Because it is continuously changing its mode. It is changing its manifestations. But at the substratum of all these changes perceivable, there is one thing that is unchangeable. That is what is called Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna tries to explain this so that it could be understood by even the ordinary people, those who have not been able to uh, meditate and experience that uh, highest uh, glory of Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna again points out, he is just giving the glimpses of uh, the nature of Brahman, because Brahman can be described by, it can't be described by words fully. Whatever words you may exhaust, they all fall short of it. Nobody can explain the nature of Brahman. It is only to be experienced. That is why it remains a great mystery. So Sri Ramakrishna tells this Brahman is beyond form and formlessness. That is to say, it is beyond the manifestations and the unmanifest conditions. What all the forms we are seeing now, they all go to unmanifest condition to be manifested again. That's the nature of the forms. But Brahman is the source of everything. It is a light of lights. It is the strength of strength. It is the power of the powers. It is God of the gods. That's it. So, Sri Ramakrishna tries to explain this. And gives the means of uh, reaching that state also. While explaining the definition of uh, Brahman, whether it could be defined at all, he gives the example of father and two sons. The father sent two sons to a preceptor so that they can learn about the knowledge of Brahman. That is, the boys went to the teacher to learn under him the sublime teachings of the Upanishads, which deal with the knowledge of Brahman. What is this world, how it came, what is the nature of Prakriti, all these uh, things, uh, the, the various manifestations of the power and uh, its various functions. So these two boys went and studied well. After some time, after some years, they returned back. The father himself, a great spiritual person. He knew to a certain extent about Brahman and the connected matters. He just wanted to find out how far these boys have grasped the teachings of the Upanishads under the teacher. So he 
called the elder one and asked him, will you please explain how brahman would be could you describe the nature of brahman the boy became very cheerful because the father is giving him the occasion to uh, talk about brahman what he had learnt he had a sharp memory he had memorized all the upanishad texts he began to recite wonderful passages from the various texts of the vedas like this like this like this like this he began to recite that's it then the father put the same question to the second boy the anger one when that boy heard this question he also became very cheerful for he could share his knowledge of brahman what did he do he just kept silent never opened his lips meaning thereby brahman can't be described in words nobody can describe brahman it is unchangeable that is why it is called absolute reality when one gets into nirvikalpa samadhi when the whole being is absorbed in that supreme consciousness then he gets the taste of that absolute reality he gets the taste of that absolute freedom there are so many types of freedom this is absolute freedom what we call in sanskrit atyantika mukti final that's it he knows what he is that's it that is the completion of his journey that is the completion of his quest once he get into that total absorption in that supreme consciousness he becomes fully illumined so that is how shri ramakrishna explains that brahman can't be described in words and he can't be understood fully is it possible with this limit power with his limited power with our small minds to grasp that infinite brahman we must develop the spiritual dimension to the extent to have that experience you must expand spiritually that's it so he gives the analogy of uh, ant and hill of sugar a little ant it somehow it came across a hill of sugar it was so overjoyed it took one grain of sugar in its mouth while returning it began to think oh next time i'll bring the whole hill to my place is it ever possible to do that the way of shallow mind is like that people who think that way they are like this little ants but then there are shukadeva and others great spiritual luminaries 
who had the experience of god who had the visions of god but then even those great saints and sages of such magnitude they are compared to big ants that means that is why brahman is described as infinite infinite they may carry about 8 or 10 grains of sugar because they are big ants that's all so that is how sri ramakrishna uh, describes about the nature of brahman he gives lot of examples so that it becomes easy for us to have some idea about these things so that we may not keep on arguing over them it's futile to argue about the existence of brahman about the existence of god whether you believe it or not it exists there if you believe it you are the person who will be benefited if you don't believe it you are the person who are the loser that's all you can't retaliate so people in course of time because of some power and position they think they are supreme what is god i am doing all these things i am responsible for all these things if i want i can dismiss or i can fire all these people i can employ any number of people i want i have earned i have worked hard and i have earned money how could i have millions of dollars because i could work so hard god did not come and work i worked it i worked for it so i got it i am enjoying it i am god so so they go to such extent of claiming themselves as gods there are people who just because they are having some kind of uh, some sort of uh, visual, spiritual experience some sort of spiritual experience i don't know whether it is a genuine one or not immediately they proclaim to the whole world look i am the saint i have come to redeem you all come on all of you so how we are being duped by in so many ways that is really wonderful thing to think about even this shukadeva and others even they might have the vision of uh, the reality but according to one school of thought it is said they stood on the shore of this ocean of brahman they have seen it and they have touched the water but they have never plunged into it plunging is another different another experience seeing is one experience plunging is another experience both experiences are different and different uh, results are achieved but those who plunge into that ocean of brahman they can't come back to the world again how to understand this immediately shri ramakrishna gives the example of salt dole it wanted to find out the depth of the water in the ocean and then it wanted to tell others about his its experiment so it went into the ocean to find out the depth of the water depth of the ocean as soon as it entered into ocean it got dissolved how can it explain to others that's the thing 
that is what is meant by nirvikalpa samadhi people need not be confused over the there are different types of samadhis different types sampragnata samadhi asampragnata samadhi sabija samadhi nirbija samadhi savikalpa samadhi nirvikalpa samadhi how many varieties you want how many anyway the final samadhi is that when one reaches that highest state he no more argues reasoning stops permanently he becomes mute he can't describe the nature of brahman but then there are some great acharyas like acharya shankar who came to propagate the teachings of vedanta swami vivekananda in our modern age he traveled all over the world to propagate this vedantic teaching how can they propagate it unless they have that experience but then how was it possible for them to explain when it is indescribable for that sri ramkrishna again gives very good clarification these are special category they retain the ego of knowledge so that they can give this teaching so that they can share this teaching with others their whole being is concerned about humanity about the whole mankind they want to remove the suffering they they have come to show that what people are suffering it is not of permanent nature it is our own making this suffering can easily be removed so these people come to show the way how to march through this suffering how to pass through the fire of suffering without being burnt by the fire that's important we have to pass through the fire but the technique is we have to pass through the fire but we should not be burnt by the fire that's it so shankracharya ramanjacharya and madhvacharya vallabhacharya great acharyas they come with a special mission to show to the people the glorious ways of reaching the supreme reality sri ramakrishna again in a wonderful way explains by simple analogies suppose you want to make ghee the butter is to be heated in a pan over the oven when it gets heated there will be some noise sizzling noise as long as the water is there that sound is bound to come but when the last trace of the water has been dried up there is no more sizzling sound then only the clarified butter that is ghee is there now suppose you put uncooked cake into it again the sizzling noise comes up but when that cake is cooked well that uh, noise is no more heard again he gives the example of the bees the buzzing of bees you can see the how the bees uh, encircle the flowers 
But when they begin to sip their honey, all the noise, all the buzzing stops. Sometimes they get so much intoxicated with the taste of the honey, sometimes they make buzzing noise. Again he gives the example of the pitcher, empty pitcher, empty vessel which makes gurgling sound. But when it is completely filled with water, finally that sound stops. So what the purpose of uh, telling all these things, why Sri Ramakrishna has talked about uh, this uh, so difficult uh, knowledge of Brahman, etc. What was the need? The need is, what he wants to say is that in this modern age we are all weaklings. We don't have sufficient strength either in body or in mind. Suppose there is some slight change in the weather, immediately the throat begins to make sound and all sorts of uh, trouble come. Ko, ka, ko, kaf, ko, etc., etc. Disease, so many things. So, this modern age, the, we are all very much dependent on food. One day or two days, if you are not having proper food, all your uh, spirit uh, goes down. Annagata prana. So, with this weak mind and weak body, how dare you talk that I am Brahman? You may talk about it, but it is not safe for you to talk unless you develop to that state, unless you raise yourself to that high position, you should never declare that I am Brahman like that, I am God Himself like that. That will not solve your problem. He says, Sri Ramakrishna tells therefore in this Kali Yuga, in this modern age, this is called Iron Age, Kali Yuga is called Iron Age, where the senses are too much, you can't get rid of ego, but then you give a proper direction to the ego. Feel that I am the servant of God. Instead of telling I am God, say I am the servant of God. Say I am the devotee of God. Keep that relationship till you develop that high, till you develop to, to that high state. Then everything you will get. So that is what Sri Ramakrishna has emphasized and that is the purpose of his uh, telling all these uh, things. So, Sri Ramakrishna assures that one who follows this path of devotion can realize God. One can also realize God by following the path of devotion. You must know this statement has been made by Sri Ramakrishna who had realized the Supreme Brahman through various paths through the path of knowledge, through the path of devotion, through the path of action, through the path of meditation. So, he is giving the final word over these things. Follow the path of devotion, bhakti mark. That is, a religion of love. Try to love one another. Of course, you all have experience of love in some form or other. You know how to love your children. Very good. Develop that love. Try to love the children of others also. Like that. Open the ways to expand your heart. Why this modern age this path of devotion is prescribed because it is very difficult for the mind to get rid of the worldliness. It always follows us like a shadow. It lingers on in our mind in spite of our efforts. 
So, this is the method Sri Ramakrishna has given. The person who follows the path of knowledge is rather different. He tries to reason out all the time that uh, what exactly matters, what the things are to be rejected upon. So by reasoning like this and uh, concentrating on these uh, ideas sufficiently, following all the spiritual disciplines, finally he comes to the state of reasonlessness. He goes beyond reason. He passes through reason to the state of reasonlessness, to the state of to the state where he stops reasoning. That's it. Anyway, so many things Sri Ramakrishna has said about these various aspects of spiritual life. Now I should like to read some passages from Gospel. Then I shall uh, invite you to speak also about what you have read and heard so far. This is page 104, second pair from the top. The path of knowledge leads to truth, as does the path that combines knowledge and love. The path of love too leads to this goal. The way of love is as true as the way of knowledge. All paths ultimately lead to the same truth. But as long as God keeps the feeling of ego in us, it is easier to follow the path of love. The Vijnani says that Brahman is immovable and actionless. Like Mount Sumeru, this universe consists of the three gunas, that is the qualities, which are described in Sanskrit as Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, attributes what we call, all these are in Brahman, but Brahman is unattached. The Vijnani further sees that what is Brahman is the Bhagavan, the personal God, he who is beyond the three gunas, he is the Bhagavan, with his six supernatural powers, living beings, the universe, mind, intelligence, love, renunciation and knowledge. All these are the manifestations of his power. If an aristocrat has neither house nor property, or if he has been forced to sell them, one doesn't call him an aristocrat anymore. God is endowed with the six supernatural powers. If he were not, who would obey him? Just see how picturesque this universe is, how many things there are, the sun, moon, stars, how many varieties of living beings, big and small, good and bad, strong and weak, some endowed with more power, some with less. So many varieties. Then Vidyasagar asked a question. Has he endowed some with more power and others with less? Sri Ramakrishna replied, As an all-pervading spirit, he exists in all beings, even in ant. But the manifestations of his power or different in different beings. Otherwise, how can one person put ten to fight, flight, while another can't face even one? And why do all people respect you? Referring to Vidyasagar, he said, Have you grown a pair of horns? Why they respect you? Because you have more compassion and learning. Therefore, people honor you and come to pay you their respects. Don't you agree with me? Vidyasaga smiled. The master continued, There is nothing in mere scholarship. The object of study is to find means of knowing God and realizing Him. A holy man had a book. When asked what it contained, he opened it and showed that all, on all the pages were written the words Om Rama. 
nothing else. What is the significance of the Gita? It is what you find by repeating the word ten times. It is then reversed into tagi, which means a person who has renounced everything for God. And the lesson of the Gita is, O oh man, renounce everything and seek God alone. Whether a man is a monk or a householder, he has to shake off all attachment from his mind. Chaitanya Deva set out on a pilgrimage to southern India. One day he saw a man reading the Gita. Another man seated at a distance was listening and weeping. His eyes were swimming in tears. Chaitanya Deva asked him, Do you understand all this? The man said, No, reverend sir. I don't understand a word of the text. Then why are you crying? Asked Chaitanya. The devotees said, Oh, I see Arjuna's chariot before me. I see Lord Krishna and Arjuna seated in front of it, talking. Just by seeing that, I weep. Why does a Vijnana keep an attitude of love toward God? The answer is that eye consciousness persists. It disappears in the state of Samadhi, no doubt, but it comes back. In the case of ordinary people, the eye never disappears. You may cut down the Ashwatha tree, but the next day sprouts a shoot up. Even after attainment of knowledge, this eye consciousness comes up. Nobody knows from where. You dream of a tiger, then you awake, but your heart keeps on palpitating. All our suffering is due to this. I. The cow cries, Hamba, which means I. That is why it suffers so much. It is yoked to the plough and made to work in rain and sun. Then it may be killed by the butcher. From its hide shoes are made and also drums which are mercilessly beaten. Still it does not escape suffering. At last, strings are made out of the entrails for the bows used in carding the cotton. Then it no longer says hamba hamba, I I, but tuhu tuhu, thou thou, only then are its troubles over. O oh Lord, I am the servant, thou art the master, I am the child, thou art the mother. Once Rama asked Hanuman, how do you like on, how do you look on me? And Hanuman replied, O oh Rama, as long as I have the feeling of I, I see that thou art the whole and I am a part. Thou art the master and I am the servant. But when, O oh Rama, I have the knowledge of truth, then I realize that thou art I and I am thou. The relationship of master and servant is the proper one. Since this I must remain, let the rascal be God's servant. I and mine, these constitute ignorance. My house, my wealth, my learning, my possessions. The attitude that prompts one to say such things comes of ignorance. On the contrary, the attitude born of knowledge is, O oh God, thou art the master, and all these things belong to thee, house, family, children, attendants, friends, or thine. Let us stop here. So now let me share your observations and commentaries about what you have thought of. That is, uh, when you go into that uh, state of Samadhi, you will feel more and more joyful. That is the indication. And uh, you have the vision of the various forms of God, various forms of God. Once you have those visions, that gives you a kind of joy to you. You would like to have them more and more. But you have to transcend that joy to have the experience of uh, much more joy. You must keep on concentrating even though you are, you are joyful by seeing them. It's just like uh, going to a fine place. The other day I had an opportunity to go to Canada. I visited Niagara Falls. Most fantastic. Five lakes. Most fantastic. How nicely all these five lakes come and fall. 
It was so joyful. But then there are so many things like that where you feel more and more joy. So like that, the process of uh, Samadhi also. Some people, they are quite satisfied with whatever joy they get. They don't want to further, they don't want to go further up. For example, if they, are, if they see some form of God and if they could communicate to that God about uh, what they want, Oh God, uh, you see, I have got some problems in my house, will you please solve them? I am your devotee, I am your child. And the divine form, it hears his prayers because he is well devoted to him and he says, all right, why do you worry about those forms? I am, all those problems will be cleared off. And uh, in course of time he finds out all the problems are cleared off one by one. He becomes very joyful. See, he wants to maintain that uh, duality. He wants to maintain subject-object relationship. I want to remain your servant. I want you to be my master always because after all, who, who is the master? God himself is the master, wherein you are quite safe. If you, uh, if you choose somebody else as your master, you may be in for suffering. But since you have surrendered yourself to the Divine Lord, you have accepted him as your master, so you need not have to be worried on any account. So you will be gradually trained to strengthen your mind. Sometimes the difficulties come, sometimes the God will test you, your devotion, how far, is it shaking or is it stable, etc., etc. And another point is that it is not necessarily to test the devotee that God comes, though it is also one of the factors. The other factor is he wants to show to the world how God comes to the rescue of the devotees and how the play of uh, Bhagavan and Bhakta, how they can be looked upon by others and take inspiration from them. Sri Ramakrishna himself, you take example, how he would every day, he would go to the Mother Kali shrine and he would, oh Mother, he would call every day. He would converse with the Divine Mother. So that would give a lot of inspiration to the all people who would come. What? Here is a person who is talking with the Divine Supreme every day, like he is talking with us, he is talking with the Divine Mother. Though we are not seeing, he is seeing her. It is reality to him. His mind could perceive, because his mind had reached that highest state of perfection. God can be seen only when the mind is in a highly perfected state. Now, the, the point is, you may be working in the world, but what Sri Ramakrishna tells, why don't you think that thinking about God is also one of your work? As you run after, as soon as morning 8 o'clock comes, means you don't have time even to say hello, because you, are, you have to run, otherwise you are late. I have seen many people, they have no time to speak to. The phone may be calling, but he is not bothered. On the other hand, he is uh, disturbed by the phone call, because his, uh, his mind is always in the office, he has to reach office at 8 o'clock. So, with the same intensity, do you have that kind of anxiety, in thinking about God. If thinking about God also becomes your part and parcel of your activities, then definitely you will be guided upon by God, sure about it. That's why Sri Ramakrishna says, just before beginning any work, you think of God and then start the work. That means what? If you have to go to office at 8 o'clock, you are getting up at 7.30 or 7 o'clock, but then Get up little early. That means get up early. That's why all the Mahatmas say, get up early and do your devotional practices in the early hours of the morning, just even before sunrise. Brahmi Mahurta they call. 
and when the whole nature is uh, peaceful, in that peaceful state, it's easy to concentrate upon the Divine Lord, just pray humbly to Him and appeal to Him that I am going to work today, please protect me in every respect, like that, and then you go to your work. You can maintain that uh, peace in your mind because you have already given that thought into the mind. That is the meaning of spiritual orientation. Now the point is this, now I am engaged in 12 hours outside. Why? I am not uh, engaging myself uh, for, no, uh, for no benefit of it. Why am I engaging myself 12 hours? Because I will get, every hour I get 15 dollars. 12 hours means 12 hours into 15 dollars. That much money I am getting. So there is the incentive for you. So, even, even if necessary you are prepared to spend even more than 12 hours if they give money to you. So how the mind is entangled that way? So in the same way are you increasing your time with respect to your devotional practices to God? Well, you know the value of it. In fact, you are in your course of uh, experience, sometimes you have that feeling also. But today I had a very good meditation, morning I thought it was so nice, it was so good. True. But when it is so good and so nice, why don't you do it regularly and uh, Increase the time. You reduce the 12 hours to 10 hours. Maybe you may, you may get less money, doesn't matter. That means you must develop the lifestyle in such a way. Don't, be, don't have too much luxurious life. You live the life to the extent that you should live. You be contented with what you are having. You work to a certain limit, not beyond uh, unnecessarily working too much uh, and straining yourself too much is not good. So, final and the final analysis, the, you must develop the mind in such a way, your interest in the God should go, should take up the priority to the interest in other things. So, that is the way. That's why Sri Ramakrishna used to say, how to intensify that? Every month you go to a place, uh, be, become associated with uh, some surroundings and do intense spiritual practices, forgetting about all your work, etc. Monthly once or twice for about three days in a month or one week in a month. Completely devote your time for devotional practice and then again come and do your work. Like that you must try to raise the mind and you must develop the interest and taste in spiritual life. Then slowly you will enjoy the benefit of them. Now you are telling uh, that uh, Devi is full of power, that means Purusha has no power. That's good, that is your temperament. See, temperaments are different. Yeah. Well, Some people, they look upon, you see, Lord uh, Krishna himself has said in the Gita, mm -hmm. that all the forms, different forms of gods and goddesses are his own forms. Mm -hmm. So if that truth is taken mm -hmm. seriously, then you, there should not be any conflict. What is wanted is, you have to concentrate upon one particular form so that you can achieve the result. Mm -hmm. That form itself, that's why we have, I don't know whether you have observed in our uh, pujas. We address, when we worship, offer worship to Sri Ramakrishna, we say, Om Aim Sarva Deva Devi Swarupaya Sri Ramakrishnaya Namaha. The embodiment of the embodiment of all for all gods and goddesses. Mm. He is all gods and he is all goddesses. Mm. He is Guru. I am. I am means Guru. I am. I am. That is the uh, mantra of uh, Guru. Mm. Om is Parabrahman. You are Om. You are Parabrahman. You are Satchidananda Guru. You are all gods and you are all goddesses. To you I offer my salutations. That is the meaning of that mantra. Mm. So, when I am offering worship to Sri Ramakrishna, I use this mantra. Suppose I do offer my worship to Holy Mother. You know, I don't know whether you, whether you were present on Holy Mother's birthday. On Holy Mother's birthday, we did puja here. What was the mantra? Om Aim Hreem Sarvadeva Devi Surupinyai Sri Sharada Devi Namaha. Hreem, Hreem is the, that is the Shakti, uh, it is the symbol of Shakti. That is the, it is the potency, the latent power. 
it is the seed it is seed of the power hrim just by repeating om hrim you can have the final experience of god just by repeating the seed mantras you can have it but we we attach forms to the seed mantras only to satisfy your mind for example my mind suppose i am very much fascinated to have to see the form of uh, ganapati mm-hmm. but i want that form mm-hmm. so simply telling the seed mantra may not satisfy you mm-hmm. so suppose you take the name of that ganapati you feel more uh, more interested in uh, doing your spiritual practices having that form so what they do they attach that om gam ganesha namaha om is there that he is himself par brahman even just repeating om kar itself is enough to have the highest realization it is true so the point is forms have come just to help the people different temperament they can take any form they want take any form you want but fix your mind on that particular form don't waver your mind don't create conflict in your mind don't engage yourself in a futile arguments or any such things don't disclose uh, your uh, your all your uh, inward uh, experiences to other people don't uh, try to claim you are a big uh, saint simply because you have got some some kind of uh, peace uh, some experience you may try to have immediately don't run about and broadcast she look here come on come on all of you like that don't go to advertise so be very that's all there are distractions you must know they are called spiritual distractions one is worldly distraction mm-hmm. another is spiritual distraction because people will respect you and they they come all the morning to night thousands of people will be flocking will be at your doors so you feel elated you want to enjoy that sight finished so to that extent you stop your further practices and your mind is get stuck up there no become strong that's all repeat more intensely try to love god more intensely that's it so we shall conclude on its already time chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within o name stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart opening its cup to knowledge of thyself o self drown deep in the waves of his bliss tasting his nectar at every step bathing in his name that bath for weary souls various are thy names o lord in each and every name thy power resides no times are set no rites are needful for chanting of thy name so vast is thy mercy how huge then is my wretchedness who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name o oh, my mind be humbler than a blade of grass be patient and forbearing like a tree take no honor to thyself give honor to all chant unceasingly the name of the lord o lord and soul of the universe mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue the playthings of lust and the toys of fame as many times as i may be reborn grant me o lord a steadfast love for thee a drowning man in this world's fearful ocean he is thy servant o sweet one in thy mercy consider him as dust beneath thy feet ah how i long for the day when an instant separation from thee o lord will be as a thousand years when my heart burns away with his desire and the world without thee is a heartless void prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion neither imploring the embrace of thine arms nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence though it tears my soul asunder O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, 
Lead us from the darkness to light and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers. May all realize what is good. May all be actuated by noble thoughts. May all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good betide all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied.